Hi, this is Dr. Gregory Sadler. I'm a professor of philosophy and the president and founder of an educational consulting company called Reason.io, where we put philosophy into practice. I've studied and taught philosophy for over 20 years, and I find that many people run into difficulties reading classic philosophical texts. Sometimes it's the way things are said or how the text is structured, but the concepts themselves are not always that complicated, and that's where I come in. To help students and lifelong learners, I've been producing longer lecture videos and posting them to YouTube. Many viewers say they find them useful. What you're currently watching is part of a new series of shorter videos, each of them focused on one core concept from an important philosophical text. I hope you find it useful as well. In Meditation 3, René Descartes will make a distinction between different kinds of reality between what he calls objective reality and he's got several different terms, formal or actual, or sometimes he also talks about eminent reality as well. And the distinction that he makes very easily trips up late modern readers in part because the way that he's using the term objective in his time, which was kind of a regular usage, is almost opposite of what we have in mind when we hear somebody talking about objectivity or objective reality or anything along those lines. So let's talk first about what it is that he means by these terms and then we need to discuss why these distinctions are, are so important not only within Cartesian metaphysics as a whole, his, his attempt to sort of reconstruct knowledge, but also for the argument that he's making in Meditation 3, which is going to give him the existence of God and God not being a deceiver, which then allows him to reconstruct the possibility of knowledge of the external world. So what do we mean by objective reality? Let's start where we are typically today. When we say objective reality or objectivity, typically what we have in mind, although sometimes we have to like think this through because we use these words in careless ways and rather vague senses, when we think it through, what we usually come up with is whatever is, is there, whatever is being referred to should be the same for me as it is for you, as it is for anybody else. Everybody should be able to observe the same thing. There's a kind of constancy. There's a kind of universality to it, right? And why would that be the case? Because it really does exist that way out there in reality, whatever reality happens to be. So when we talk about being objective, we typically contrast that against being subjective, right? And the subjective would be something that's just in my head and doesn't correspond to the reality out there. And we could talk about the objective realities being interpreted in multiple ways and biases that people have. And okay, so that's how we use the term. That is not what Descartes means by the term. Descartes means, in some respects, almost the exact opposite. He is talking about what we would call subjectivity, but not a subjectivity that's a pure arbitrariness or something to be dismissed because it only belongs to an individual. Rather, he is talking about object, objectivity or objective reality, if we want to be very clear. Objective reality is the reality that things have as ideas in the mind. That is, in terms of their representation. So the idea that I have of God or of Descartes or of my body or of hydrogen atoms or any of those sorts of things, the idea existing in my mind has objective reality. And this is well worth you know, uh, dwelling on for a moment. A lot of people tend to think of ideas as really being kind of nothing and the outside things are what matter. Well, that's not the case at all. Ideas are real. They have a reality as ideas within our mind, right? It's not that they're nothing. Otherwise, they couldn't have the distinctness that they have. They couldn't have what Descartes calls clarity, their capacity to impose themselves upon us, to provide us with a certain kind of self-evidence. The people who dismiss what's in our heads as, oh, that's just figments of your imagination, they don't know what they're talking about. 
ideas have reality as ideas. That is, in fact, a way of existing within one's thought or mind. So that's very important. Objective reality is the reality that something has as a representation, as an idea of the mind. What do we contrast to that? The reality that something would have, say, out there in the world. And, and that is what Descartes typically calls formal reality. He will also use the term actual in a few places. And he will also talk about something being eminent. Now, being eminent means that it's not completely uh, active as formal, but it, it's sort of potentially there, right? So ideas have a certain eminent reality within, uh, within, you know, their, their, what could originate them, you could say, but isn't necessarily originating them at the moment. Be that as it may, formal reality is what we would typically call objective reality. It's the, the existence of the thing independent of observers out there in the world, right? So this is an incredibly important distinction that he is making here. And he goes on and he, he, he's uh, talking here in the third meditation about different kinds of ideas that we have in our mind. And another thing that's, that's really characteristic about this is not only do ideas have objective reality, some ideas have more objective reality than other ideas. There is what we could call a hierarchy of objective reality. And for Descartes, this has to do with what he calls their degree of perfection that is being brought to fulfillment. And he says, if we consider images um, of which, you know, these over here represent one thing and others another, it is evident that they are very different between themselves. Why? Because, as it stands, those that represent substances, he says, are without a doubt something more and contain in themselves, so to speak, a greater degree of um, being than or, or perfection than those which represent merely what he calls modes or accidents. So what is he talking about here? A substance would be something like, for example, a book or myself or this chalkboard or a light or whatever it happens to be. Those are extended substances. The mind itself is a thinking substance, right? So a human being is a substance as well. And the thoughts that you have would in fact be modes or accidents. When he says accidents, he means this in the scholastic sense as something that can be attributed to that substance, something that belongs to it, but is not the totality of that substance and could be removed from it. So I'm thinking right now about Rene Descartes, imagining him in my head uh, with his, you know, little smirk that he, that he has in his painting. Okay. I, that thought that I have is a mode of my substance as a thinking thing. And if you're thinking about that, the substance that is me, the thinking thing, that has a greater degree of, he would say, objective reality than the thought of Rene Descartes and the painting of him with his little smirk, right? And we could, we might go further and further down. Descartes doesn't worry about this. He's, he's interested primarily in establishing the fact that there are degrees of being or perfection or objective reality for uh, different sorts of things that we have as ideas. So already we've got substances. And by this, he means finite substances primarily because he can compare it to another kind of substance, which he calls God. So he says, uh, in addition to this, that by which I conceive a sovereign God, eternal, infinite, uh, immovable, all-knowing, all-powerful, the universal creator of all things which are outside of myself, that, I say, has certainly in itself more reality, more objective reality than those uh, of uh, finite substances that are represented to me. Now, all of this is still at the level of ideas. 
So he's not yet saying that there is a God out there who's greater than everything. He's saying considered as an idea, that idea not only has a certain you know, greater value, it has a greater objective reality than those of finite substances. Finite substances in turn have a greater objective reality than those of modes or accidents of substances. And in turn, modes or accidents of substances have a greater degree of objective reality than the idea of nothing, neant, which uh, Descartes brings up quite a few times in the meditations. So now we have this hierarchy established. And as it turns out, the hierarchy mirrors that of formal reality, because in formal reality, really existing out, outside of just our minds, if there is a God, God is going to be on top of the, the hierarchy. And then substances, things that are real, that, that other things can be in or be predicated of, how are we going to frame it? Those are going to be less, less real than God, but still quite real. And then we have modes or accidents of substances, less real. And then finally we get down to nothing, not really real at all. So, whether we're considering it in terms of objective reality or formal reality, we have, according to Descartes, this sort of hierarchy in place. He goes on and he says, now it's something that's manifest by the natural light that there has to be at least as much reality in the efficient and total cause than is in its effect. Because where else would it get that reality from other than its cause? Now, when it comes to formal reality, things existing in the world, that's not that hard of a, a, a sell for us to accept, right? There has to be at least as much reality in the cause as there is in the effect, because otherwise, how are you going to get the effect? Descartes goes on further, and he says that this doesn't just apply to what we can talk about as um, uh, uh, you know, one thing that possesses in itself formally or eminently whatever is in the composition of the thing that it's producing. He is the example of a stone, <clears throat> but he says that this applies just as much to our ideas. So that this applies just as much to objective reality uh, effects cannot come from causes that would have less reality or perfection, objectively speaking, than um, they, 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 they would in any other case. So this is particularly important. Descartes is going to use this as a linchpin in his argument for the existence of God, which is going to depend on this interplay between objective and formal reality.